I'd like to introduce Drew Lamar. He is the PI of Cubes Hub, which is a biology, math, and community focused group. And he'll be sharing a little bit about his hub and what this group does. So take it away, Drew. Okay, so without further ado, so uh, we're part of the Cubes Project, um, and our full tag is the power of biology times math times community. So we have three things being multiplied together as a cube, right? So uh, got a little double meaning going on. Cube stands for, it's a little bit of a mouthful, I didn't put it in the slide, but quantitative undergraduate biology education and synthesis. So it really does kind of encapsulate a lot of the main things that we tackle in particular were uh, mostly undergraduate based and uh, were uh, first and foremost an educational type of gateway also had a, on the slide later. Um, when we focus on quantitative biology, uh, not that we don't end up working with people outside of the quantitative bit, we like to think of quantitative very broadly so that it pretty much encompasses all of biology. Uh, but we try to, you know, we are really, we're creative to help on the, the infused or quantitative techniques and methods into the biology curriculum. We updated our mission statement recently. Um, it says now, CUBE is a community of math and biology educators who share resources and methods for preparing students to tackle real, complex biological problems. So, um, you know, we are working to bring together the math world and the biology world and, um, and where they might overlap. And uh, we are very, very community focused. Um, and we really work hard to um, help instructors, in particular faculty, it's really our main focus as a faculty, uh, to get access to some of the most recent pedagogical techniques. So that's why you have sharing of resources and methods. Um, so a lot of you know instructors don't get enough, um, uh, you know, their job is necessarily give them a lot of credit for working on their teaching. And so we are here to try to help faculty learn about the new techniques, and in particular as it applies to bringing quantitation into the biology classroom. So again, I mentioned earlier, we are first and foremost an educational gateway. Not that we don't, of course, uh, offer services and things for people doing research, uh, but we focus mainly on education uh, to start. So when we first started, we got an, uh, an NSF award. Um, it's, uh, it was an IU's award back in 2014 now, I think. And um, this was our sort of flow chart that was in our uh, proposal. And it sort of gives you the four main uh, pillars of the CUBES enterprise. Uh, the first at the very top is what's called the CUBES Consortium. So uh, one of our big goals was to bring together existing partners and entities who are already working in the space of quantitative biology education uh, under one umbrella to see if we can't leverage each other's uh, uh, resources and, and uh, programs to uh, um, sort of have a little bit more of a directed uh, leadership and get some more get, get things done that we couldn't have done individually. Um, As so you can see, just sort of smattering of example of people on there. We have quite a few partners now. It's been on the order of about 50 partners um, at different levels of, of um, that we're working with them. The one that's probably most in line with uh, the Hubzera folks, of course, is the Cubes Hub, which is to the right. Uh, we wanted to create a uh, you know, cyber infrastructure gateway uh, to house all of these things so that we could you know, build the community, the online community, um, so that teachers could get together in a virtual space and um, can you know, uh, do all the things that are related to our mission statement. Um, the lot, you know, when we first saw Hubzero, I remember when I first saw it a long time ago, uh, it was like, I was, it was like a kid in a candy shop and I got really excited about it because I saw all the functionality um, and uh, all the community functionality that was already built in um, and also as well the ability to you know, launch tools and software in the cloud was a really important thing for us, especially when we, you know, we try to bring, um, you know, the computation, which we kind of put under the umbrella of quantitative, um, we wanted to bring computation into the classroom as well. Uh, so that, you know, so, you know, come, sort of joining forces with Hub Zero was sort of a no-brainer for us. Uh, another thing at the very bottom, Cubes Metrics. That was, um, this is because, this is set up um, as a focus area 
Because again, as I mentioned previously, a lot of times teaching scholarship is not uh, rewarded um, very much in promotion and tenure. And so, you know, this part, this wing of the CUBE's uh, proposal was about thinking about ways that we can uh, create a system uh, to help faculty, uh, you know, kind of report back to their institutions on any kind of pedagogical work that they do with us. That would, you know, give them credit for their work and help them in their promotion and tenure. Um, and then finally, uh, what we kind of consider to be the hearts of CUBE's are uh, the faculty mentoring networks. So these are, uh, you know, sort of formal, I like the, I think my colleague described it as um, long term, uh, over the course of a semester, usually, where we meet regularly online. Uh, if we can, we meet first in person at a meeting. Um, but then what this allows us to do is it allows us to, with these faculty in the faculty mentoring networks, we can work with them as they're implementing these pedagogical strategies or materials in their classrooms. And so we can just trade, you know, uh, you know, pros and cons of different strategies and uh, help them in modifying materials to add in quantitation, things like that. And so this is really our, the heart and soul of what we do. As I said, we're a community first and we're, you know, as much as I love uh, the cyber infrastructure and, and the, um, you know, the whole code and all the bells and whistles and functionality, we try to make it as much as we can uh, a people type of enterprise. And so it really is, as this sort of says, it's, it's the heart of what we do. Um, and so what I'll speak speaking of next is mainly going to be talking about this in the beginning. Now, I mentioned some of these cultural challenges. This is a big reason why CUBE was created. Um, one of the issues that we're dealing with with faculty is isolation. It's difficult for faculty to share teaching materials and strategies, in large part due to fear of public scrutiny. So many of them don't want to share their materials online willy-nilly, but they're much more willing to share their materials and ideas if they're in one of these faculty materials. So it's sort of a pseudo-private place where they can have, you know, not have any fear of messing up or uh, worry about you know, what might happen in their implementations. Um, another thing that we hear that is a challenge is recognition, as mentioned in the metrics component. Recognition of teaching scholarship and hiring promotion and tenure is underdeveloped and widely varied. So it really is a institution by institution specific thing. And so uh, by uh, having faculty mentoring networks where we can actually have the one-on-one -on -one with the faculty and address their specific needs when it comes to recognition. I think that it is really, it helps a lot to have that one-on-one -on -one type of, of focus. And then finally, adoption. Adopting existing teaching materials from repositories is challenging as modifications are almost always necessary. So if you talk to any instructor or teacher, um, you know, most more often than not, what you'll find is that they will not use the material as is. They will do some sort of modification. And so one of the things that we're really interested in is how can we track these modifications? And how can we make it so that they can uh, very quickly and easily grab existing materials that are online and make those modifications in such a way that they aren't lost to the rest of the world, right? Um, and so I'll be speaking a little bit more to that um, a little bit later on. So this is actually a screenshot from our uh, upcoming site redesign. We actually have been working on redesigning the websites uh, and it will be launched actually March 4th. Uh, this is the part of the Faculty Mentoring Networks page. I just wanted to show you a, sort of a glimpse of four of the different kind of Faculty Mentoring Networks that we have and some of the partners that we work with. So uh, on the left you see that we have NEON, uh, the National Ecological Observatory Network. So they have collected a lot of data and their, their goal right now is to try to get that data into the hands of researchers and educators. And so we're working with them to figure out ways, you know, how can we bridge that gap right, that they have to get their data into the classroom. Um, Integrate, which is, um, I believe, their, uh, their it's, uh, CERC, I believe, is where they're housed mainly, uh, but they're working with us in faculty mentoring network. We also have, next to that, uh, Plants by the Numbers. Uh, so this is uh, all about botany. Uh, Botanical Society of America is one of the partners with this. I think ESA might also be partnered with this one. I'm not entirely certain. Uh, but that's one of the partners that we're working with with the faculty mentoring network. And then finally on the right, there is specifically ESA. Uh, they do a lot of uh, faculty mentoring notes with us, um, mainly surrounding data and data discovery and how to bring research data to the classroom. 
Um, one of the things that we are, this is also a, a kind of an update, updated page from your site. Is, uh, we are really pushing uh, Cubes as sort of offering services to the community. Um, at the bottom, you can see four different examples of uh, things that we offer. Um, and we're sort of seeing ourselves as a virtual center. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the idea of the National Science Foundation Center. Uh, but it's very service oriented. And the idea is we are really trying to um, kind of uh, redefine Cubes as a place that we can serve specifically educational projects. Uh, and some of the examples that we can, service that we offer are, uh, you know, if you create, if you create, an, if you get an NSF proposal, like maybe get like a research coordination network, which is from the NSF and it's all about creating community, uh, you need to build a website, all that kind of thing. Uh, you need to, you know, disseminate out information, you need to have all of the kind of the online tools that you, that you all know about that Hubzero can offer. And so rather than then needing to start their own website, we just say, you know, come to Cubes, we can help you to build your community and build your website. Um, we also give them the ability to create faculty mentoring networks around whatever it is that they're doing, um, and uh, as well as running workshops. And more recently, we've been pushing the idea of curating their own resources. Um, so how can they... Uh, you know, create their own publication, you know, digital uh, objects that have their own branding and their own metadata, and um, so that you know they can actually maybe even their, their own curation pipeline, which is what I know publications now offers. So we're really kind of trying to explore that and offer that as a service to to a lot of these partners. As I said, we're focused on community. So um, we really like to push a lot of, you know, the, the dissemination of workshops that people are running, uh, faculty mentoring networks, if they, people can use the blogs, we push out their blogs, um, their own newsletters, we'd like to try to push their own newsletters. And again, really work with our partners to help them in their dissemination of their, their products and then their events and their communities. The way that we do that <laughs> is we try to push uh, and offer uh, super groups very strongly and, and hard with a lot of these partners. Um, in large part because um, they desire many things that a super group offers, like autonomy. So many of them want to have as much autonomy as possible. And we found that when talking to people, you know, their their initial desire is to have their own website and everything because they want to have they want to make it very clear that this is that their brand is there, right? Um, and it also helps to avoid confusion for the users on where are they? Are they on cubes or are they on these partner groups, right? So we, we push supergroups pretty strongly and give them out like, almost like candy. <laughs> um, you know, again, they want their own faculty mentoring networks. So they want to be able to have their own, they want to be able to facilitate their own mentoring networks. And so we work to help them do that. Um, and again, as I mentioned, they want to have their own open educational resources, which can include things like their own master time, for example, their own metadata or their own tagging ontology. Um, so, uh, I think the, the terminology in the hub is focus area. Um, so, you know, they, they want all of these things that are customized to their particular needs. Um, just recently, actually, there's been interest in um, some partners wanting to have their own newsletter capabilities. Um, so right now, I think, you know, it's on the back end only. I know that you can give people access, but they want to be able to to, uh, to have their own newsletter through the hub, and so we're looking to have them to do that as soon as possible. And again, very recently as well, as people have been expressing interest in creating their own courses. So a big focus uh, that we've put in the past year is on open educational resources. Um, so one of the big uses that we're using for open educational resources as are as products for faculty mentoring network. So faculty that finish a mentoring network with an actual product that they can publish and get a DOI and can put on their CV, it really helps with that, um, with that cubes metric uh, portion of the grants. Um, <laughs> so we really are pushing hard for them to be able to use uh, open education resources for products. And we also use them as well for uh, to disseminate any materials from our partners. Um, and again, so again, one of the things that we want to offer our partners is the ability to spread their, their gospel far and wide. And so um, and part of their gospel is any products that they may have. Um, one of the biggest things that helped us with this is, is, the, is the development of publication forking. Uh, this is in large thanks to SUCI and Sean Rice specifically for the development here. Uh, this is through, through their uh, extended development support program. 
And um, we thought that forking and cloning was very important. Um, those that aren't familiar with forking, it's essentially if you, if you use Git or GitHub, it's the ability to clone something and, and uh, retain the attribution. Um, one of the big reasons why we liked having this or wanted to push for it is that it keeps the activity on the hub for tracking. So our, our biggest fear was that many people would find the material they wanted to use in the classroom, and they would download it, but the minute they download it, it's offline. And then there's no way to track the changes. Um, it makes it that much harder for them to use to really contribute back to the community. And so if you add forking and cloning, then, they, then it, it keeps the attribution as well as um, it keeps the activity on the hub, so you can use it as another metric of use for a particular uh, open description resource. Um, and again, as I mentioned, teachers almost always modify materials before they use in the classroom. So this would be a great way for to be able to track uh, the modifications that, that teachers might make to these materials, and hopefully make it easier for them to show that back to the community. Now, one of the challenges that we're experiencing right now is that this is information overload. So, one of the questions that we have is how do we properly show that evolutionary tree of the modifications that is most helpful for the user? So, you can have these you know, umpteenth bazillion forks, and those can have forks of forks. But how do you make it so that, you know, the user, the instructor, can very quickly say, you know, figure out, well, what are the actual differences between these different forks, and which one is going to be most helpful for me? Right. Um, so, you know, coming up soon is we're, we're probably going to try to request some UX support for this one. Or go down our own UX road, because this, this is going to be an interesting, albeit fun, exploration into uh, how to better with this. So, I didn't talk about quantitative yet, but I want to address it here. Um, we are very broad when we talk about quantitative. Uh, we'll usually lump mathematics, statistics, and computation underneath the quantitative umbrella. And, you know, if you know anything about data science, of course, which is a very big catchword these days, it uh, definitely falls under, the, uh, under this umbrella as well. In fact, data science is, is, is unique in the sense that it pretty much includes all three of these uh, points, and then some. There's, you know, whatever the, the, the context of a specific science enterprise is, as well as ethics and all kinds of other stuff that get involved in So, one of the things that we're pushing right now, very soon, is uh, what we're watching right now, is um, getting into the data science game. So, we really are trying to, uh, some of our next steps, build a bridge between the classrooms on the left in data and data science and right. As I mentioned previously, we already want to tackle the entry networks. Many of them focus on data, like both with NEON and ESA, and ESA and other partners and, and uh, societies, uh, to do just this. Um, so again, I mentioned NEON is in particular is one of the ones that we're just already working with. And uh, a more specific example of whether we're trying to do this, well, this is one reason why we want to address it. It's because of the many challenges in data science. This is going to be specific to biology, but I'm sure many of these points will be applicable beyond biology as well. So, um, one of the issues is faculty training. So, many biology faculty are not the main experts in statistics and data analysis. And many of you I know, or I'm pretty sure, of, or have heard of data carpentry and software carpentry. So these are uh, um, people in programs that exist to help train faculty, and they usually run workshops. Um, it's a very distributed model, so they have many, many people that are trained in the workshops. Um, teaching them R and, and Python and, and different uh, ways to do data science. Uh, what, what Cubes can bring that's a little bit different of the game is the faculty mentoring networks component, where we do a more of a, rather than a one-off kind of workshop, which I think you know, are great, I don't, you know, I'm not saying anything bad about those, um, we give up the, the longer term uh, during the course of the semester while they're in the classroom have experience. So we actually do work with data cards and software practice many times. Uh, but we do feel like the faculty training point is a really important challenge that we need to work to address. Um, data is messy, so there's many options in using real data, but real data is very messy. So they need the skills to be able to deal with data. Um, a lot of software is very complex. Many opportunities are using research tools, but software is complex. And so it can be a challenge to bring research tools directly into the classroom because it, of the uh, uh, overhead in sort of teaching students how to just navigate the software. Uh, the accessibility issues, many, as mentioned, lack of user friendly open source software. Um, computers and labs might require substantial setup for our use of software. 
you'll recognize these bullet points as one of the big reasons why you know, Hub Zero's ability to launch tools in the cloud is really important in the browser you know, to address a lot of these concerns. Um, and then this is something I've experienced myself. Student laptops are highly variable in computational ability. Set up and maintenance. So when I, when I teach my biostatistics class, I would have my students run in their studio on their laptops. And invariably, everybody has a problem with installation, even with our studio, which tends to be pretty good. And so, um, so um, there's also cognitive overload. Uh, biology students need to learn about a gazillion things. Biology, math, physics, chemistry, statistics, human design, data skills, etc. It really is one of the most interdisciplinary sciences out there. And so, you know, you add data science to that, and it just becomes even more uh, of a possible issue. Um, and then add to that the fact that, uh, you know, scripting and programming is becoming more and more important in this field, but it's becoming more, more and more highly regarded. So reproducibility is becoming a more important idea in science. And you'll see plenty of papers out there talking about this. And part of reproducibility is the ability to script a program. So, is there a way to bring that into the you know, plethora of cognitive overload issues that I'll just need to address? So, uh, one of the things that we're exploring right now <laughs> is um, the development of a uh, software called Serenity. Um, the tagline is Data Science in the Classroom, which will try to bring analysis code and data all under one umbrella um, and make it so that it's sort of a bridge between uh, students and the code. So, um, you know, I found that I teach my students code by statistics. I teach them scripting. We learn R in particular. Um, but it is a challenge for them to both know the biology, know the statistics, and to know the code. And so, it, you know, I found it would be, well, I feel like it would be really great to have this bridge software that is really designed for education first, um, that can help you know, have lots of APIs that connect into data like neuron data and, and um, dryad data, that kind of stuff. Can have a, a way for them to learn the code, but in a way that's a little bit more visual. Um, and then have a lot of ways to do the analysis that is a little bit more like, workflow oriented. Um, so I won't say much more about that. It's just that's one of the things that we're pushing towards. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to talk more about it. Okay, and that's pretty much all I have the energy for. So um, I hope that gives you some idea about what we're about. Um, this is just, you know, I'll end on my acknowledgement slide. Uh, I think there are three pillars of thanks that I want to give. Uh, the first is, of course, the CUBE leadership team, and the, the, the plethora of people involved in what has made us successful so far. I'm going to give a lot of thanks to the Hub Zero team um, and everybody there. It would have been awesome and really fun to work with. And of course, the SGCI um, most recently. Uh, our team involved there. We use a lot of their services, the boot camp, uh, extended developer support, the UX team, as well as the workforce development, um, have all been extremely helpful in uh, getting us to work on it. Okay, that's it. If, uh, I would love to take any questions if you have any.